Hello, dear listeners, and welcome to another thought-provoking episode of Light of Reflection. Today, we take on a particularly challenging topic as we continue our exploration of Richard Dawkins's criticisms of religion. In this episode, we focus on his remarks about Islam and Christianity, where he suggests that Islam is currently the most harmful religion, while Christianity has evolved beyond its violent past. We'll explore his arguments in detail, challenge his viewpoints, and offer a perspective that goes beyond the often simplistic portrayal found in mainstream narratives. Let's dig deeper together. You know, you, you seem to, to hate Islam. Is that putting it too strongly? Let me put it this way. I hate um, female genital mutilation. I hate executing apostates. I hate cutting people's hands off. Um, I hate throwing homosexuals off high buildings. Those are all things that I hate. They I'm sure there are lots of things that have hated been that, that have been done within Christianity that you would of hate. Of course, as there well. have, but yes. that was in the Middle Ages, not not anymore. I mean, Christianity is responsible for the most appalling things uh, centuries ago. But as I said earlier, the Christianity is largely, not entirely, grown out of that. So, so for you, is it is it all about what those religions represent? now, right, today as we speak in our world? As I said... Rather I, than over the course of history. I mean, would you say that Islam is worse than Christianity over the course of history, or are they equally bad? Probably equally bad if you, if you integrate over the course of history, but now is what matters, and now Islam is worse, yes. Just explain why. Oh, come on, I've just, I've just told you, throwing homosexuals off buildings. But these are all sort of extreme minority things that you're describing. They're, well, not, they're not normal well, lived well, Islam well, for well. one and a half billion people, are they? Well, I mean, no, they don't. One and a half billion people don't do it. No. But nevertheless, they get Quranic and, and um, um, Hadithic, if that's a word, um, authority for it. But you're taking, surely, you know, the, the behaviour of a tiny minority in the extreme and projecting that across a people in a religion. It is a tiny minority, and I certainly do not wish to suggest for one moment that a majority of Muslims do that kind of thing. Of course they don't. But the doctrine to which they subscribe, which is Islam, sanctions that kind of thing. And didn't Christianity? Yes, but it... Richard Dawkins asserts that Islam is the most harmful religion today citing practices such as apostasy, punishment, persecution of homosexuals and other seemingly harsh rulings, while implying that Christianity has grown past its own history of violence and intolerance. He presents this argument with a narrow perspective that is often more influenced by cultural stereotypes and sensationalist narratives than by a true understanding of religion. Let's address these points systematically. Before answering all of his arguments, I believe it is important to discuss what Islam is, as many people, including Richard Dawkins, don't understand it. Islam means to submit to the will of God. Anyone who follows Islam is called a Muslim. In the Quran, there are more than 10 verses where prior prophets prayed to die as Muslims. For instance, Prophet Joseph, Yusuf, prayed, cause me to die a Muslim and join me with the righteous. Quran 12, 101. Even the disciples of Jesus said, we believe in Allah and bear witness that we are Muslims. Quran 3.52 Islam, as revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, was also the complete code of life. Allah says in the Quran, indeed the religion in the sight of Allah is Islam. Quran 3.19 So true Christians, true Jews and all people believing in one God are inherently Muslims because they submit to the will of God. Islam also means peace. The inherent meaning of Islam is peace. God says in the Quran, there is no compulsion in religion. Guidance is clear from misguidance and people are free. Quran 2.256 This is an important aspect of understanding Islam, that people are given the freedom to choose their path. Uh, let's now dissect Dawkins' arguments. Dawkins' approach of associating certain extreme practices with Islam is fundamentally flawed. It is like condemning an entire school because one student, without following the guidance of teachers, commits a crime. Religious teachings, especially in the form of divine books like the Quran, are the foundation upon which laws and practices are derived. 
But like any constitution, these divine books must be understood, interpreted and applied in their true form. In the past, holy books before the Quran were altered by people for worldly gain, leading to deviations from their original purposes. The Quran, unlike its predecessors, has been preserved in its original form, but even so, Islam as a religion was largely hijacked after the passing of Prophet Muhammad, PBH. The true interpretation of the Quran was preserved by the Prophet's progeny, the Alul Bayt, who were marginalized and persecuted, leaving only a minority of Muslims, primarily Shia Muslims, who strive to uphold these teachings. Therefore, judging Islam based on the actions of an extreme minority, often misinformed or misrepresentative, is misleading and inherently unjust. During the interview, the host pointed out that Dawkins' views seemed subjective rather than objective, a significant flaw for someone who prides himself on empirical evidence. Dawkins portrays Islam as inherently violent, using few media examples without considering the wider Islamic world and the diversity of beliefs within it. There are 1.8 billion Muslims globally with a very significant majority leading peaceful lives focusing on family, community and spirituality. The portrayal of Islam based on the actions of a fringe minority ignores the overwhelming majority of Muslims who condemn such practices. It is akin to judging all of Christianity by the actions of the Westboro Baptist Church or other extremist groups. This approach reveals Dawkins' myopic worldview and questions his overall credibility as an objective scientist who is influenced by his thoughts, not evidence, and then fits the narrative according to that influence. Let's look at Dawkins' perspective on Christianity. He suggests that Christianity has evolved beyond its violent past, but what does this really mean? In truth, the people who committed atrocities in the name of Christianity, such as during the Inquisition or the Crusades, were not following the true teachings of Jesus, who preached compassion, love and peace. The concept of having grown out of those actions implies a certain moral progress, but what has actually happened is that societies have shifted away from religion altogether, leading to secularization and materialistic pursuits. Churches are closing in the United States, and a growing number of people identify as non-religious. According to Pew Research, nearly 30% of adults in the US now identify as religiously unaffiliated, a stark rise from previous decades. This shift is not about progress in faith, it's about abandoning religion as the true teachings have been diluted and often lost. Even Dawkins himself, who was raised as a Christian, moved away from the faith, not because the teachings of Jesus failed as he still admires Jesus and quotes his Sermon on the Mount, but because the essence of those teachings was no longer being upheld in his environment. The real question to ask is why are people leaving the religions? We need to understand that blessings come from following the true divine message of God. If the true message is corrupted, blessings are lost and confusion takes hold, leading to people abandoning the religion altogether. Confusion leads to extremism due to manipulation by political and or religious leaders. That is what happened with many of the religions, including Christianity. Again, this doesn't mean that the message of God was wrong. It shows that the lack of guidance is because of human materialistic desires. Religion has the power to transform lives only when it is practiced with genuine devotion and submission to God's will. When that essence is lost, people naturally become disillusioned and drift away. When Dawkins discusses practices such as executing apostates or persecuting homosexuals, he paints Islam with a broad brush based on cultural distortions rather than authentic religious teachings. It's important to clarify that not all of these practices are even rooted in Islamic doctrine. For instance, there is no authentic narration in Islam that endorses throwing homosexuals off rooftops. In fact, today such actions are being carried out against Muslims by a certain nation, but we don't see Dawkins speaking against them. This shows his double standards. These actions are a reflection of cultural and political motivations rather than genuine religious injunctions. The punishment for theft, for example, involves cutting off a thief's hand, a punishment often cited without understanding its broader context. This ruling in the Quran was meant to serve as a deterrent in an environment where justice and social welfare were paramount, and it was not meant to be applied indiscriminately. 
It required certain conditions to be met and was to be executed to leave the person perfectly able. Islam, as preserved by the Alul Bayt, emphasizes a deep understanding of God's words, justice, compassion and context before any law is enacted. The aggressive punishments mentioned for certain acts are consistent with the prior divine religions. This shows that there are certain immoral acts that are abhorred by God in society and for these abhorrent acts, there are punishments. For acts that might disrupt society today, we also hand out punishments. One should ask, why do we do that? To maintain order in society and deter bad acts. This is the same reason strict punishments were kept, albeit with specific conditions. The consistency of what is deemed abhorrent across religions is proof that the Quran is the continuation of the divine message. True Islam, as practiced by the Prophet Muhammad and his family, empowers individuals, including women. Islam encourages modesty, such as women covering their heads, but it does not prevent them from pursuing education or working outside the home. There are numerous examples throughout Islamic history of women in leadership roles, business and scholarship. Dawkins seems to overlook these nuances and instead relies on cultural stereotypes. In conclusion, Dawkins' critique of Islam is based on a superficial understanding of its teachings and practices, relying on stereotypes rather than substance. His portrayal lacks nuance, context, and an appreciation for the rich diversity within Islam. True religion, when practiced with sincerity and devotion, uplifts individuals and societies. And it is our duty to seek out the authentic teachings that bring out the best in humanity.